last class, we introduced some different types of brands of energy. We talked about kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy. And we also talked about uh, the transformation of energy from one form to another and the conservation of energy during that, that transformation. So today's class, I wanted to look at some further examples, some more examples of energy conservation uh, because it's such a fundamental, such an important principle. I wanted to talk about energy conservation when you have what we call conservative forces and energy conservation when we have what you call non-conservative forces. And I also want to introduce towards the end of the class the concept of power, which is related to work. Um, power is the rate of doing work. So that's, that's our plan for today. I wanna start though, just with a sort of big picture of energy. Um, a sort of step back and give a big perspective on energy. So that as we work through the details of problems of energy, energy conservation, um, we're aware of the, the importance, the meaning of these ideas of energy and energy conservation. So uh, if you remember, we began our work on energy with the idea of doing work. And we un now understand that when forces do work, they are exchanging, moving energy around. Uh, we then moved on to uncover, to explore different forms of energy, uh, different brands of energy. So we talked about, you know, kinetic energy. We talked about gravitational potential energy. We talked about spring potential energy as examples, illustrations of types of energy. There, there are many other forms of energy. There are many other types of energy, but we met those three. Um, and for example, kinetic energy is an energy that's associated with uh, movement, an object's movement. Um, potential energy is an energy that's associated with an object's interaction. And for the latter, the potential energy, you know, there's potential energy associated with gravitational interactions, there's potential energy associated with electrical interactions, uh, there's potential energies associated with all sorts of interactions. Out of sort of uncovering and exploring this kind of hidden garden of this or that type of energy, this or that form of energy, came an overarching principle that whilst we can move energy around from one form to another form or one owner to another owner, um, we never destroy energy. We never create energy in that process. It just flows around. It just moves around and is never lost and never gained. And that's an extremely important sort of guiding principle for how universe works. And so that's what we're applying today. That, that overarching principle about energy conservation and our understanding, our recognition of different forms or types of energy and the fact that forces, when they act, they, they move energy around. They cause energy to flow around. Okay, uh, I've got a few graphics. I uh, spent a lot, a lot of time, probably way too much time, making these little pictures to help us visualize energy conservation and energy concepts. Um, and I'm also on the next couple of slides gonna summarize the equations for energy conservation and, and forms of energy. So, so here's a picture of a little universe that I'm imagining uh, in which um, in this universe we have gravity and we have springs 
and we have motion. And those were the ingredients in the last class. And um, I've got three little piggy banks to represent these three forms of energy that we met in the last class. Downstairs here is the kinetic energy piggy bank. Over here on the top left, that's the spring potential energy piggy bank. And um, over here on the right, upper right, that's the gravitational potential energy piggy bank. And at any moment, there's a certain amount of energy in these energy piggy banks, like there would be a certain amount of cash in the real piggy banks. And um, when forces act, like in this little universe, it's spring forces and it's gravitational forces and there'll be a net force. When those forces act, all they're doing is causing this energy to flow around between, to move around between the three piggy banks. And so that's what I'm picturing here. Um, you know, when a spring force acts over here on the left, the spring force does spring work and it moves energy into and out of this spring potential energy piggy bank. When the gravitational force works, acts, it does gravitational work and it moves energy into or out of this gravitational piggy bank. And, you know, the net force, likewise, when when it acts, it does work, and that moves energy into or in out of kinetic energy. And these energy dollars are just flowing around, but never lost or never, never gained. And that's energy conservation. That's my picture of energy conservation. Now, energy itself is a more abstract thing than the money in the piggy banks, but uh, it's the same idea that energy flows around, is moved around, but never lost or gained. Okay, so there's a, uh, some equations, some formulas that go along with this um, energy perspective that make this energy perspective in physics very, very rigorous. Um, so the first ones I'm listing here are related to that concept that forces acting do work, they transfer energy. And we met a equation, it's the top one here. Let me get my pen working, I'm missing it. this equation here, which tells you exactly how much work is done when a particular force acts. So that's a, a big master equation. And then there's some equations down here that remind us when um, the net force, a net force acts on an object, what that does is change the kinetic energy of the object. When the gravitational force acts on an object, what that does is change the gravitational potential energy associated with the interaction. And when a spring force acts on an object, what that does is change the um, spring potential energy that's associated with the interaction. And so those are how work done, the trend of the energy is related to changes in the stores of the different energies. Whenever you do some spring work or gravity work or network, you must be correspondingly adding to or subtracting from the energy in those uh, spring potential energy, gravitational potential energy, kinetic energy piggy banks. And so that's the idea here. You just have to be a bit careful about the signs that are different for kinetic energy versus potential energies. Okay, next slide. If I can get to it. Here we are. Let me clear that. So finally, the, uh, here are equations for those different types of energy, those different forms of energy. And the way we actually uncovered these equations was by knowing the corresponding forces that go with these types of energy. So you know, gravitational potential energy is associated with the gravitational force mg. Spring potential energy is associated with the spring force minus kx. Kinetic energy is associated with the um, uh, with second law force, F equals ma. And from those equations, you can figure out the corresponding um, energies, 
kinetic energies, spring potential energies, gravitational potential energies. And so these are the, the master equations for the, these are the equations, oops, that really tell us how much energy is in each of the piggy banks in terms of either the motion of the particle or the position of a mass with respect to the earth or the compression or the stretch of a spring. They tell us the details of how the piggy banks are working. Finally, on this slide, here's that overarching principle expressed as an equation of energy conservation. So think of before and after some forces have changed things or initially and finally after some forces have acted. The total energy before, the total energy before these changes due to these forces that are acting is the same as the total energy after these forces have acted. So energy may have been, may have been moved around from the different energy piggy banks but no energy was lost or gained. We can write that simply as the total energy before equals the total energy after. We can write it this way. Sometimes this is useful to break out that initial energy into kinetic energy and potential energy forms and break out that final energy into kinetic energy and potential energy forms. And the sum of those forms must be the same before and after the forces have acted. And we can also break it out. Sometimes this is handy. This is also equivalent that if you change the potential energy by a certain amount, you must correspondingly have changed the, um, the potential energy, the, the kinetic energy. So if you um, acquired an extra joule of potential energy, you must have lost a joule of kinetic energy so that energy overall is conserved. Anyway, those are all the ways that we can express energy conservation. Okay, so now let's get on to the, the, the more fun stuff, the even more fun stuff of solving some problems with energy conservation. Uh, so here's an example problem. Um, in this problem, we've got a 80 kilogram roller coaster and it's sliding down a frictionless incline and it's going to collide with this spring, this large spring at the bottom of the incline. And um, it's going to collide with that spring and come to rest. And um, we're going to figure out how much that spring gets compressed. And we're told a bunch of numbers associated with the problem. So we're told the mass of the roller coaster car. Uh, we're told the um, initial height was 30 meters. The final height is zero meters. We're told the, um, the compression of the spring. Okay, so let's see if we can solve this by energy conservation. The first point of, I wanted to make is that if you try to solve this by, try to solve it from a force perspective, it's a very difficult problem. It's actually a very complicated problem. So the reason it's complicated, let, let's look at the, some of the forces that are, that are involved. So here we are um, on the top right. Let me get the pen working again. Upstairs here. Um, on the incline, the roller coaster on the, at the top of the incline, there's a couple of forces that are acting on it. There's um, an, the gravitational force downwards in Magenta. There's the normal force in blue. And then over here on the bottom right, I've drawn forces acting on the um, uh, roller coaster as it hits the, the spring at the bottom of the incline. So there, there's a gravitational force downwards, there's a normal force upwards, and now there's a, a spring force as we're compressing the spring. So that's, that's picturing the, the roller coaster moving down the incline 
um, from the top of the incline to the bottom of the incline from the perspective of the forces that are acting. And we see these three forces that we're familiar with, the gravitational force, the normal force, the uh, fric frictional force, spring, uh, sp the spring force. The problem with solving this problem by force perspective is that during the trip down the incline and during the compression of the spring, these forces, at least the normal force and the spring force, are changing. And that makes it very hard to apply the force perspective to solve this problem. So as you might imagine, right, as, as the object slides down the incline, right, well, the gravitational force doesn't change. It's always the same. But look, the, the slope of the incline is changing. And so the normal force will change its direction. And in fact, it also changes its size. So that's complicated. Also, on the way down the incline, well, there's no spring force until we hit the spring. And then the spring force starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger the more we compress and compress the spring. So this is a challenging problem if you try to solve it from force perspective. And it's challenging because the normal force is changing and the, grav and the spring force is changing. And that makes it very hard. And that's the, this is an, a great example of the utility, usefulness of the energy perspective. So next slide, let me go on to next slide, is, um, is a picture of adding the energy perspective. So from the energy perspective, what is happening as the roller coaster starts from rest, runs down the incline, strikes the spring, compresses the spring and comes to a stop? Well, at the top of the incline, oops, at the top of the incline, we've got an at rest roller coaster with an uncompressed spring. And all the energy in this problem is stored in gravitational potential energy. So here, the gravitational potential energy piggy bank has got all the energy. As we roll down the incline, we're turning some of that gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. As we compress the spring over here on the, on the right hand side, we're turning that kinetic energy back into a potential energy, but this time spring potential energy. And now we fill up the spring potential energy piggy bank. So from the perspective of energy in this particular example, we start with gravitational potential energy and we're just gonna turn it into spring potential energy. And we don't have to know about the details of the changing normal force, the changing spring force between where we started and where we ended up. All we have to know about is where we started and where we ended up. And that's always the strength of an energy method, an energy perspective. What counts is just the beginning and the end and exactly how you got from the beginning to the end, from the initial to the final, from before to after doesn't matter that much. You don't have to worry about it in solving this problem from the energy perspective. Okay, so that's gonna be great because that allows to solve this problem. So let's try and do that. And here's my solution. And it all fits neatly on one slide. And I even, you know, Read, wrote down all the gory detail of it to make sure it filled up one slide. So the basic idea is that uh, energy is conserved, that the initial energy of the roller coaster at the top of the incline is going to be equal to the final energy uh, at the bottom of the incline. So that's our starting point. Now, in general, in general, there might be kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, spring potential at the top of the incline and kinetic gravitational potential, spring potential energy at the bottom of the incline. So I just expanded this energy initially 
into the possible forms that we have learned about. I then noted, right, well, you know, the object starts from rest. So there's no initial kinetic energy. And although it speeds up and slows down as it goes down the incline, it ends up at rest. So there's no final kinetic energy. Also, I noted that the spring potential energy when the object was at the top of the incline, well, that's, that's going to be um, uh, zero because the spring's not compressed. And the gravitational potential energy when we've given up all this elevation, come down to ground level, that's going to go away at the bottom of the incline. So actually, all I really have is in this picture here, turning, as we said, gravitational potential energy initially into spring potential energy finally. That's what's happened. Okay. So then I can just fill in, remember my master equation for the gravitational potential energy that we got from the gravitational force? I fill that in. The mass of the car times the acceleration of gravity times that initially, initial height. And then I fill in the master equation for the spring potential energy due to the compression of the spring. Half the spring constant times the square of the compression. And I end up with this equation here. And this equation here contains the quantity I'm trying to figure out, how much the spring got compressed in terms of other quantities that I know, most importantly, the initial height of the roller coaster. And so I rearrange this equation for x over here on the left. Uh, so I multiply by two, I divide by the spring constant, and I take the square root. That gives me this little equation here. I fill in all the numbers of 80 kilogram mass, acceleration of gravity 9.8 meters per second squared, 30 meters of vertical elevation fallen, and the spring constant of this spring, 15,000 newtons per meter. And over here on the bottom right, we got the amount that spring was compressed. And we solved it by energy, energy conservation and an understanding of the forms, the brands of energy. And we could not have solved that. We would never would have solved that by the force perspective. Okay. I want to show you a second example of um, applying energy conservation. And um, let me first show you um, a little demonstration that's related to this example. So in this example, we're going to, um, you know, I always used to watch Tarzan when I was growing up. I don't know that anybody watches Tarzan now. But uh, Tarzan, when I was growing up, was always swinging from vines in trees. Um, and that's what he did at every, every single episode. And um, in this particular problem, we're told that Tarzan swings on a 32 meter long vine where he's initially at an angle of 33 degrees to the vertical. And as you know, if you swing on a rope, you swing on a vine, um, as you swing downwards, you're gonna get faster. And we're gonna find his speed at the bottom of his swing, at the lowest point on his swing. And um, this is a, a, another problem that's a fantastic example of energy conservation methods and why you would rather use those over force methods for solving this problem. But I want to show you the demonstration first. So I've got to um, share a different screen if I can here. Okay, hope you can see it. And um, what you're looking at here is, you know, here in engineering at the University of Kentucky, we built this object and we stuck UK sticker on it because of that. And um, what you see is in the middle, where's my mouse? There's a thin wire here. And down here is methyl Tarzan. So this is Tarzan. And um, behind you see 
a diagram that shows you potential energy. So if you're high up over here on the left, or high up over here on the right, you're going to have a lot of potential energy, or metal tarzan would have a lot of potential energy. And then down here, you see kinetic energy. If you're moving fast, you're going to have metal tarzan is moving fast, then you're going to have a lot of kinetic energy. And uh, what we're going to see is tarzan swinging from a vine, or metal tarzan swinging from a wire, and we're going to see energy being transformed from kinetic to potential energy and vice versa. But overall, as you watch this, imagine how energy overall is being conserved. Despite the different forms, the total energy is being conserved. So metal Tarzan needed a little bit of a hand to get going. Um, but here he or she goes. Let me slow it down because it's kind of fun. And you can notice from this video, it's actually really clear in this video, that when he gets high up or she gets high up, Metal Tarzan gets high up on the left or the right, the far left or the far right, slows right down and for a moment comes to a stop. That's when he's or she's all gravitational potential energy. And when he swings through the vertical, that's when he or she, metal Tarzan, is going fastest. And that's when he or she has the largest kinetic energy. And what you're seeing in this swinging metal Tarzan from the energy perspective is this constant exchange that's going on between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy that's caused by the forces acting. The forces acting are gravitational force and the tension in the, the cable. And those forces are continually transforming energy from one form to another, from kinetic to potential, but they, they're conserving it. Okay, that was fun. Stop sharing that guy. And uh, let's go back to the lecture. And let's try and solve this problem. I got to get the chat back. Okay. So, um, just to summarize, we're going to imagine Tarzan swing on the 32 meter long vine where he starts at an angle of 33 degrees, and we're going to find out his speed at the bottom of the incline. That is our job. And so I drew it, first of all, from a, um, a force perspective. And so that's what you see in this slide here. Um, here's um, spherical Tarzan now. Um, because he or she's put on weight. So spherical Tarzan in orange. And here is the vine. And here is the vertical. And Tarzan's going to swing down from 33 degrees to the vertical through the vertical. And we're told Tarzan starts from rest. So here's the initial speed speed of Tarzan, V0 we call it, and here's the final speed as he goes through the vertical, uh, V we're calling it. And um, from the force perspective, there's a gravitational force that's going to act on Tarzan that's acting straight downwards. There's a tension force here in this nice magenta or aquamarine or whatever it is, uh, that's acting along the vine. And uh, that, those forces will cause the, the net, a net force, that's in magenta. Uh, I have no idea what these colors are, purple. Uh, that's in purple here. And that causes the acceleration of Tarzan. That's why starting from rest, he gets faster and ends up with this speed V. The problem is from the force perspective is that although gravity is constant as Tarzan swings down, the tension force is actually not. You can see it's changing in direction. It's along the vine. 
it also changes in size, which means that the net force that also changes in size because and direction because the tension is changing, which means that to use Newton's second law and solve the final speed from the initial speed from a force perspective is very tough, very hard with a, a changing force. And so this would be a horrible problem for us to solve with the force perspective. And I would never solve it with the force perspective. This is a perfect problem for the energy perspective. Okay, so here I've added the energy perspective to the diagram. From the energy perspective, um, Tarzan started at some initial height, I'll call it X naught, in the tree and swung to some lower height, I'll call it X, uh, when he's vertical. So he swings downwards. So that means that there's a, a change in gravitational potential energy. There's actually a release of gravitational potential energy. And where did that energy go? Well, Tarzan started from rest. Here's his initial speed, V naught, that's zero. And he acquires some speed. Here's his final speed, V. And that kinetic, that potential energy, gravitational potential energy that he gave up is now turned into um, uh, kinetic energy that he owns at the bottom of his swing here. And it's from that energy perspective. This is a lovely problem from the energy perspective. And we're going to solve this problem from the energy perspective. Um, there is just a little bit of um, geometry work that I did over here on the left-hand side to prepare myself for applying the energy perspective. The thing is, we need to know vertically how far did Tarzan fall. Well, we weren't really told vertically how far we were, he would fall. Rather, we would tell the angle of the incline. But knowing the angle of the incline and the angle of the incline, what am I saying? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, the angle of the vine. Knowing the angle of the vine and knowing the length of the vine, we can find this vertical distance. So the way you find this vertical distance is that the distance from the top of the vine here to the bottom of Tarzan's swing, that's going to be 32 meters because that's the length of the vine. That vertical distance is 32 meters. The top of the vine to Tarzan's original height, that's this distance here. Let me get the pen working and, and mark this. So this distance this distance is the length of the vine. It's not the length of the vine. It's actually the side of a right angle triangle that's made up with the vine as the hypotenuse, this horizontal uninteresting distance as the uh, opposite, and this interesting vertical height as the adjacent. So if we want this distance here, in blue, we can take the length of the vine and multiply it by cosine of 33 degrees. And that's what I did over here. And that was 26.8 meters. Well, if I know that's 26.8 meters, and I know this distance here, that's the true length, full length of the vine, then I can take the difference between this, this 32 meter length of the vine and this 26.8 meters that Tarzan is below the top of the vine and figure out how far Tarzan fell or how far vertically he swung. And it's 5.2 meters. And so that was a little bit of geometry over here that I did ahead of the calculation. I hope that's okay. Okay, so now um, having done the boring old geometry, let's go on with the exciting um, energy perspective. Okay, 
So here we are. And my goal here, just a reminder, is I, I, I know the distance that he swung downwards. That's 5.2 meters. I want to um, calculate the speed he arrives at the vertical with. How fast is he going there? Now, I did make a little bit of a choice um, when I did this. If we look over here on the left-hand side at the diagram, I chose his initial height to be the 5.2 meters and his final height to be um, vertical height to be zero meters. That's, a, that's actually a choice that you can make. I mean, you could choose, for example, the initial to be zero meters and the final to be minus 5.2 meters. Or you could make some other choice. Now you can make yourself your life a little bit easier, a little bit more complicated with those choices, but all that actually counts is the difference between the heights. It's 5.2 meters higher over here on the left or 5.2 meters higher lower over here on the right. That's what counts. But I've just made a, a choice of where my zero is. And I've called it the bottom of the swing zero in this case. Okay, so energy is conserved. So Tarzan's initial energy on the vine is going to be his final energy on the vine. Now energy in this problem, there's no spring. So energy is either kinetic energy or gravitational potential energy to begin with or kinetic energy and potential energy uh, at the end of the trip. So I filled in the, the different forms of energy, half mv squared for the kinetic energies and um, mgy's MG for, um, for the potential energies. Now, initially, Tarzan is not moving, so he has no kinetic energy. And finally, Tarzan's reached where we called y equals zero, the sort of zero elevation. So that's zero too. So really the equation just becomes this little middle piece that the initial potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy. That contains the thing that we want. Here's the, um, the speed of Tarzan. It contains the important thing that we knew, the initial height of Tarzan. And so we can solve Tarzan's speed in terms of his initial height. That's what I do here. Okay, I multiply by two. I divide by the mass, I take the square root, I get this equation here. Notice it didn't matter whether it was big Tarzan or small Tarzan, the mass cancels out. So he might have put on weight and become spherical, but it didn't matter how much weight he put on in answering this problem. Um, the speed comes out to be the square root of twice the acceleration of gravity times the height that he fell, the elevation that he fell from. And those are numbers we know. I can put in 9.8 meters per second squared for the acceleration of gravity, 5.2 meters for the um, elevation that he fell from. And, and I get, if I do this calculation, 10 meters per second. And we solve this problem neatly, easily, straightforwardly with energy arguments. And we couldn't have solved this problem easily, straightforwardly, neatly with force arguments. So that's the, that's, you know, a couple of classes ago, I said, you know, in physics, we think of energy and force as two different perspectives on problems. Sometimes you want to use a force perspective. Sometimes you want to use the energy perspective. Here is a classic example of you want to use the energy perspective. It's the way to solve it. You don't want to use the force perspective. It's not the way to solve it. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so I want to um, expand our universe at this point to make our universe bigger, to make our universe fuller and make our universe more complete. Our universe so far in the last couple of classes has been a universe in which objects can move and by virtue of motion have kinetic energy and objects uh, experience gravitational forces and by virtue of that can have gravitational potential energy and objects can um, compress or stretch springs and by virtue of that 
have spring potential energy. And there's nothing else in my universe or our universe. I'm going to add something to our universe. I'm going to add friction, an additional force. And the reason I'm, you know, out of all the forces of nature, you know, why have I decided to add friction? I've decided to add friction because it's the classic example, what we call a non-conservative force. And this is going to show you how you handle energy conservation with non-conservative forces. A bottom line is that it's only conservative forces that you can associate a potential energy with. Non-conservative forces, you can't associate a potential energy with them. And so you, we treat them differently. We treat them separately in solving energy conservation problems. And so we're about to explore that world with the example of friction. Okay. Okay, so to, to give you an idea of how we're gonna do it, let me start with this little slide here in which we consider an old problem, like we looked at this, I don't know, a million times, right, so far, even when we're only five weeks into the semester. It's a block sliding down an incline. And uh, we're gonna consider this block sliding down the incline uh, under two circumstances, one where there is friction and one where there is not friction. So if there's no friction, which is, let me get the pen working again, No friction is this upper box here. Without friction, there's just potential energy, gravitational potential energy, and then there's just kinetic energy, energy by virtue of motion. And as the block slides down the incline, we know that the kinetic, the potential energy gets turned into kinetic energy, but in that process, the sum of the kinetic and potential energies is constant. So this is no friction. Oh, it actually says that there. What about with friction? Well, with friction, again, when the block slides down the incline, um, there's potential energy, gravitational potential energy uh, that gets lost as it slides down the incline. There's kinetic energy that gets acquired as it slides down the incline. But in this case, the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy is actually not constant. It looks like we've lost energy. So how can I explain that? Well, the key is up here. With friction, as the block slides down the incline, there's a frictional force. And that frictional force, according to this law of how much work is done by friction forces when they act over some distance, that frictional force will do work. That frictional force is taking energy away from, transferring energy from this system of the block on the incline. And that energy actually goes into, it warms up the incline and the block. It might make noise between the uh, block and the incline. It goes into other forms, other types of energy. So it's not lost, it's not destroyed, but it's just transformed away from the kinetic and potential energy of the block. And so we have to account for that. And the way we account for that is we add in this little extra piece. The W is work. The NC is non-conservative forces. Friction does some work and friction is an example of a non-conservative force. So as the block slides down the incline, the final kinetic energy plus potential energy over here on the right is smaller than the initial kinetic energy and potential energy over there on the left. It's smaller because negative work is being done on the block on the incline by the frictional force. So this number, this, this quantity of work, WNC, that's a negative quantity that's subtracting energy from the initial, what we call mechanical energy, the total potential and kinetic energy of the, the, the block uh, on the incline is subtracting some of that energy away so that the final mechanical energy, the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the block has, is smaller than the initial. 
And so this is how we modify our equations of energy conservation to handle that naughty frictional force that can't be represented by a potential. There's no friction potential energy. It has to be dealt with by just by hand subtracting off the work that it does, pulling out the work that it does and that it robs and causes the block to get hotter, hotter, the block to make a sound. Okay. So this is where I've repictured energy conservation. I wanted to do this because I spent so much time on the arranging the piggy banks for gravity, for springs, and for motion. Uh, I wanted to use that slide again. So here's energy conservation, but now with the presence of non-conservative forces. So in addition to energy being forces exchanging energy, which is over here, gravitational forces, spring forces and the net forces exchanging energy or moving energy around energy can be taken out of this system by say a frictional force a non-conservative force and so overall the energy in this system with the conservative forces that decreases as non-conservative forces are robbing that energy away now it's not that the energy is destroyed it's important um, it's like in your house, right? Um, you, you, you wash the dishes. I, I think I did that once. Um, you wash the dishes and then the water goes down the sink. It's not like I destroyed the water. No, the water has just disappeared from the house. It's no longer in that system. And the work done by energy, by non-conservative forces is like that. It's not like friction is destroying energy. It's just removed it where it's not available to you. It's warmed some things up or made some noise or, or whatever. Okay, so that's my picture. Now I think we're gonna solve a problem. Yeah, we're gonna solve this problem that is of energy conservation, but now involving, now incorporating um, non-conservative forces. So what we're gonna imagine doing is throwing a stone up in the air. And I'm gonna throw it vertically upwards. I'm gonna throw it with an initial speed, 20 meters per second, we're told. I'm gonna throw the stone that has a mass of half a kilogram, we're told. Now, normally we think of things flying into the air and falling back down in the absence of air resistance. But this time, on this very special occasion, we're gonna think of the presence of air resistance and what that does. And we're told, so air resistance is like a frictional force. You know, we normally think of frictional forces between, you know, a block in the tabletop, a block in the incline, two hard surfaces like that. But there's frictional forces between the ball and the air, when it's thrown into the air, when it falls back down through the air. So those are frictional forces too. We tend to call those drag forces or air resistance, but they're really another version of frictional forces. And um, we're gonna incorporate those frictional forces or drag forces or air resistance and find the maximum height of the ball when thrown into the air in the presence now of air resistance. So I started here with a sketch of the problem Oh, that didn't mean to do that at all. Started here with a sketch. Uh, here's the ball in blue heading upwards. There's a gravitational force pulling the ball down. Um, that's 4.9 newtons for the 5.5 kilogram uh, ball. But now we're told there's also a drag force, frictional force, um, air resistance force that's um, exerted on the ball. Now, in the problem, we're told we're gonna start the ball from rest and we wanna figure out how high it goes. We know it starts from 20 meters per second 
and we know that the maximum height is velocity is zero, the speed is zero. And so all that information has been given to us in the problem. That's a summary of the problem, basically. Okay, let's uh, move on and solve it. And here I'm going to solve it. As I say, I'm going to solve it from this energy perspective. And um, the idea is that we start out with some initial, in general, we start out with some initial kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. That's the kind of total mechanical energy to begin with. We end up with, in general, some final kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. That's the total mechanical energy at the end. And in getting from here to there, if there wasn't air resistance, the initial energy and the final energy would be the same. But in this particular problem, there is air resistance. There is a drag force. There is a frictional force. And that does work and that removes energy. And so we've got to incorporate this. And so downstairs is basically what I'm going to execute in solving this problem. Over here on the left, that initial mechanical energy is going to be turned into over here on the right, this final mechanical energy. But in the process, we're going to steal some energy or friction, drag force. Um, air resistance is going to steal some energy. It's going to do some negative work. And we can calculate that negative work with the formula for the work done by the frictional force. It's the force times the displacement times the angle between the two. The ball is going up, the frictional force is down, so that's the cosine of 180 degrees. That's the minus sign here. And so that last little pair of equations is the procedure that we're going to um, apply to solve this problem is how we're going to solve this problem. Okay. And here we are solving it. Okay, so the, the, at the top, the figure is just the figure from the last slide. There's nothing new there. This, this is just a reminder. And then here was the equation that we wrote on the last slide. This is how we're going to solve it. This is how we're going to apply energy conservation with the presence of a um, non-conservative force. Um, in my particular case, sea level, ground level, I chose to call that initial height zero. And we're going to find the final height with respect to that. Um, and in this problem, right, we start out with some initial speed. Um, it, I don't think it was 200, and this, this somehow is wrong, isn't it? I think it was 20 meters per second. And we're going to end up with zero velocity at the highest point. I'll correct this. I'll check this. Anyway, so let's go downstairs here. Uh, if we look at this energy conservation equation, our initial potential energy, because we call that elevation that height zero, there's no gravitational potential energy there. Our final kinetic energy, because for a moment that, that ball is at rest, that's zero there. And so those two pieces go away. I can stick in the equation for the initial kinetic energy, one half mv squared. I can stick in the equation for the final potential energy, mgy. I can stick in the equation for the work done by the drag force or the frictional force, minus f times y. And this gives me an equation, if you look at it, that contains the height that we want to figure out, that's y, in terms of the other parameters of the problem. So I can go ahead and solve it. So solving it is just rearranging it. I would get all the things with y in on one side of the equal sign, and the piece without y in it on the other side of the equal sign. And then I would divide through by the factors that are multiplying y. That's the um, mg and the, the um, drag force. And if you do all that, that yields to this little equation here. The height is 1 half m times the initial velocity squared divided by mg plus the frictional force, the drag force. And you can fill it. All these numbers on the right we know. 
and you can fill them all in. And um, there's an interesting point here, a couple of interesting points. Now, the height does depend on the mass of the particle. In the absence of air resistance, um, the height wouldn't depend on the mass of the particle. But in the presence of air resistance, it does depend on the, the height of the particle. And um, that was our original problem with seeing all objects dropping with the same acceleration of gravity. They didn't all drop with the same acceleration of gravity in the presence of air resistance. So it's, it's interesting to see that come back a bit. I'm going to put back on the chat here if I can. But, but nobody's chatting with me. I don't, I mean, I've no clue if you're even out there, to be honest with you. Um, okay, so um, it depends on the mass now, which is interesting. It also, this elevation here, because there's this extra term forced in the, in the denominator, makes the denominator bigger, makes the elevation smaller. This 19.3 meters is smaller than the height if it, if it was heading upwards in the absence of air resistance. And I actually calculated the uh, answer in the absence of air resistance, and it gets to 20.4 meters rather than 19.3 meters. So just over a meter higher. So that's interesting. Okay, let's press on if I can. Okay, because I have a quiz. So, you know, the question asks, let me go to the question. Um, was energy destroyed by air resistance as the ball was thrown into the air? Or was energy not destroyed by air resistance when the ball was thrown into the air? So it's really important that energy is not being destroyed. We've never found anything that destroys energy or anything that creates energy. That seems to be a golden principle of the universe. Now, air resistance did transfer energy away from the ball. The air around the ball and the ball itself would have become warmer. You might even have heard some noise from the ball moving through the air. So those are forms of energy that remove it from the sort of mechanical energy system, the kinetic energy and potential energy of the rising ball. But that energy was, was not destroyed. We know of nothing that destroys energy. We know of nothing that creates energy. So that's, that's a very important principle. I want to show you a demo of the fact that when you have friction, there's friction here in this problem. There's friction as you slide something across a table. You probably know if you, um, well, I can do a quick demonstration here, friction. Um, if you can see me, uh, I'm not sure the answer to that. But if I rub my hands together, my hands get warm. Why are they getting warm? They're getting warm because of the friction. The friction is turning the kinetic energy of my moving hands into thermal energy. And so that's an example of rubbing your hands together, it warms your hands up on a cold day. That is non-conservative friction doing, doing work and turning kinetic energy into thermal energy. Uh, I got a nice demonstration of that too. So I'm gonna share a different screen. Okay, hope you can see it. And um, you're gonna see me when I was a little bit younger in this one. And we're gonna see how friction, with friction, we can actually make fire by turning kinetic energy into thermal energy. Next on my list of priorities is fire and securing it can be tough. What I'm doing now is making a bow. It takes a little perseverance, but once you've mastered it, it's as good as having a box of matches. Bit of smoke starting. Need enough of that to make an ember to then drop into the tinder. Here we go. Okay, then the ember on a tip carefully into the tinder and then just nurture it.
There we go, we've got a flame. Okay, so that was a nice example. Um, I turned in that example uh, motion, kinetic energy. I was rotating that stick with the bow. I turned that motion, that kinetic energy, into um, thermal energy. I warmed up those little, that little piece of wood, fractions of wood, um, by, by the frictional force. The frictional force did work and turned kinetic energy into, into um, uh, thermal energy. And I was able to light the fire. So that's a nice example. And so, you know, again, we sometimes think of friction as a nuisance. But look, there's, you know, if you're a caveman, if I was a caveman, um, friction is pretty useful for getting a fire going. Okay, so what am I doing now? That's a good question. Uh, going back to the slides, and let me get share those again. And I want to, I want to talk about power. And um, power in physics is related to work. So we're going to talk about the relationship between power and work. And of course, work is related to force. So we're actually going to be talking about the relationship between power, work, and force. OK. So on this slide, the next slide, I've got an equation, an equation about power. And so we're going to, the takeaways from this slide and the next slide are the equations for power. And then we'll try and look at an example of um, uh, of calculating power. So on this slide, the, the main point is that as, as we know, I'm going to get my pen going again with annotate. As we know, when forces act, um, they they do work, which means they transfer energy. Power, what we mean by power in physics, is actually the rate at which you do work. So work is measured in joules. The rate at which you do work is measured in joules per second. And it's another example where, you know, like power and work are used in our everyday language. You know, my boss has power over me. He makes me do work sitting at my desk. Um, power and work in physics have very definite meanings, very quantitative meanings. Work is the energy transfer in joules, and power is the rate of energy transfer in joules per second. And we, those, the, that energy transfer rate is so important. We give those special units too. We call them watts and give them the symbol W, which are joules per second or J over S. Anyway, um, here's that master formula in the middle here that says power on the left is the rate of doing work, which means is the amount of work you did divided by the time it took. So, you know, if I'm running, I mean, if I'm running around the, I don't know, the soccer field, right? I mean, no, I don't know why I say that because I'm, I've never run around a soccer field. Um, but if I were running around the soccer field, if I figured the amount of work that I did in joules and I figured the time that it took me in seconds and I divided by the, the work I did by the time taken, that would be the power. Um, that would be the power. Um, let me make a remark on power. Um, so if you burn coal and if you explode dynamite, those both involve the release of energy. Um, they both involve doing work and they both involve power. Now, it's interesting that you get more energy out of coal than you do out of dynamite. You would think you get more energy out of dynamite than you would out of coal, but you get more energy out of coal than you get out of dynamite. The difference is the rate 
at which you get energy out of dynamite versus energy out of coal. Dynamite, the energy is released, related, released almost instantaneously. So it's extremely powerful. Coal, if you burn it, that energy, that energy is released much more slowly. So the, the power is much smaller. So you get more work out of coal than dynamite, but you get more power out of dynamite than coal. Second, second equation that I want to induce. Okay, so as we said, work is done by forces, so power is generated by forces because work and power are related. Uh, for work, we had a formula that expresses the relationship between the force that is acting and the work that is done. It's this guy here, so we've met this a number of times, and here's the force, and here's the work that's done. And then there's a parallel equation for the power that's generated by forces. Here's the force and here's the power. And the difference between them, you can see it here and here, the work that's done by a force is in proportion to the, the distance over which the force acts. And the power that's generated by the force is in proportion to the, um, the speed um, at which the um, object was moving. And so, um, those are the partner equations for the work done and the power generated when a force acts. And so both of those can be useful. Both this guy and this guy can be very useful. Again, you know, the power is measured in watts. Uh, the work is measured in joules. A watt is a joule per second. And you can see that in this equation because instead of meters and displacement for the work, you've got meters per second and velocity for the power. So there's, there's the difference between them. Okay. Um, and just as a example, right, it's, so now I'm going to run, I'm going to run a, a hundred meters. Supposing I would do, try and try and do that. Could I, could I run a hundred meters? Well, if I run a slow jog, I could probably run a hundred meters, maybe. If I try and do a fast sprint, I'd really struggle to do 100 meters. Now, the slow jog of 100 meters, the fast sprint of 100 meters, I'm probably going to do about the same amount of work, same amount of joules consumed. But the power that I need to generate for the slow jog, which lasts a long time compared to the fast sprint, which lasts a small duration, the power for the slow jog is much lower. The power for the fast sprint is um, much higher. This is why you see the sprinters. You look at sprinters. Look at Hussein Bolt, right? He's this massive, muscular person. He has to generate a lot of power. Um, you look at these marathon runners, right? They're like little sticks. Um, they don't need to generate a lot of power. So. They, they don't need those huge muscles. They just need endurance. They just need endurance. Okay. So let's end up with um, a question on power. Um, and this one's about the relationship between power and work. So we're told here that we're watching the space shuttle launch. So this, I, I don't know when we were last launched a space shuttle. It was probably in the last century. Um, not quite, but it seems like that. Anyway, we launched space shuttle and we're told that this um, 2 million kilogram space shuttle, it's amazing. It goes from zero to 48 100 kilometers an hour in two minutes and it reaches in that time a height of 45 kilometers. What power? What power must be delivered by the engines to get it to that height and that speed in that short amount of time? Must be, yeah, I mean, you can tell from the pictures, enormous, absolutely enormous amount of power. 
So here I'm going, I'm going to calculate it. And I'm going to, I did it in two steps. I calculated the work and then the power. And I, I calculated the work by thinking about energy and I calculated the power from its relation to work. So let's do this. Let's start with work first. Well, the, the, the work that must be done on the space shuttle to get it to four, 45 kilometers and to get it to that speed of, I converted it into meters per second, 1,333 meters per second. The work that is needed is whatever work is needed to give it that extra gravitational poten potential energy and uh, that extra kinetic energy. And so that was my starting point here. The work done by the engines must have given it that kinetic energy associated with that speed and that potential energy associated with that height. And every number over here on the far right, we were told in the problem. So I just filled in the mass of the space shuttle, um, the speed and final height of the space shuttle. I just plugged them all in and that gave me the work. That's this line here. And you know, sort of, roughly two thirds of it was associated with the kinetic energy gain and one third was associated with the potential energy gain. So the engines had to get it high and they had to get it fast. So their en energy, their, their work was used for both of those items. Then all I have to do is get the power, is take the, um, the work that the engines did and divide it by the time that it took. And it took 120 seconds. And if you divide that amount of power, it was like um, two point, what's this, a, a trillion, 2.66 trillion joules divided by 120 seconds, I get 22 gigawatts, 22 billion gigawatts, just to give you a perspective, right? That is, th what, what other things make a lot of power? Well, power stations make a lot of power. That's where we build power stations. There's, you know, coal-fired power stations that used to be in the past. There's uh, hydroelectric power stations. There's nuclear power stations. How much does a nuclear power station deliver? How much power? It's 10 times smaller than this rocket blast that got the space shuttle into flight. And so this is truly an uh, amazing engineering feat to deliver this amount of power. Anyway, I'm going to end there. We've spent three classes on energy, energy concepts, energy conservation. And next week, we're going to spend some classes on another important quantity. Uh, it's momentum, um, momentum conservation and um, momentum concepts. And so um, together, energy and momentum really become these huge guiding principles for how the universe works. Okay, 